So uh, my name is Perry Miller. I've been uh, at Montana State University for about 23 years. I'm a cropping system scientist working mostly in crop diversification kinds of things. And it struck me when I was putting this slide together that I used this standard backdrop from Montana State University. And look what I saw up here in the corner. Um, so isn't that better? Uh, maybe we'll get there one day. Um, here's, here's a snapshot of oilseed acreage. So we do grow a lot of different oilseeds or have at one time or another in Montana. And the, the yellow bit here is canola. And it's, it looks like it's you know it made a significant jump in 2017. Looks like it's holding its own. And from the prices I'm hearing, I'm guessing it'll be up in, in 2021. Um, and so I would, I'm just going to take a few minutes here to talk about two canola research interests that I have. And just in the hopes of stimulating discussion. So this isn't meant to be sort of any exhaustive report or anything, but just to, to raise some issues. I want to talk about winter canola that I've been playing with for 20 plus years, mostly without funding, sometimes with, and optimal seeding rates for spring canola. I want to bring that up too. And then ask the question, what's holding us back from doing more? Um, so why did I get inter interested in winter canola? Uh, quite frankly, it was, um, from attending a canola workshop. And I don't remember where it was, but I remember Don Wysocki from Oregon was presenting some uh, winter canola work that he had done. And, uh, and it was, this would have been the early 2000s and he was showing 100 bushel per acre winter canola yields. And I didn't know such a thing existed. I had never heard of such yields with canola. And so I thought, well, we better start playing with this more seriously at Bozeman. And, uh, and actually in 2007, in our sort of our first agronomy experiment, I've got two different uh, winter canola treatments. This was actually an early seeded treatment. This was a later seeded treatment. Uh, can they see my mouse? Oh, hopefully they can. Okay. Is the mouse visible? We can see it, Eric. Good. Okay, so in, our, in uh, my first try really in an agronomic setting, I hit ni almost 90 bushels an acre. And I thought, man, I can do 100 bushels an acre. And so we've played with it in various sittings since, have never topped this number that we hit right off the start. We had spring canola uh, it, it adjacent in, com in comparable studies, and you could just see the kind of yield differential we were looking at. Uh, even in a year that was pretty wet, 2009, uh, where spring canola did better, we still had winter canola yields that were, that were looking pretty darn good. So it didn't look like there was anything to lose with winter canola. And so we've done it, we've looked, we've poked at it, played around with it from a lot of different angles. Uh, one year we grew varieties from both Kansas and Idaho and the Kansas varieties survived better. So not very scientific, but we basically have stuck with Kansas germplasm since then. Uh, we looked at fall seed dates. We've looked at seeding rates um, and some conclusions there is our fall, our, our fall seeding dates are risky. They're just, they're not very reliable. We usually lose about 50% of our plants over the winter period. And it's a pretty brittle system. It seems like if one thing goes wrong, the whole house comes tumbling down. Uh, and so I do think now, you know, I, as what I've been seeing from uh, elsewhere in the Pacific Northwest and farmer experience, uh, seeding in the summer and probably on chem fallow needs to be the focus for our research. And that's probably what it will be going forward. We, but we did look at stubble, or, uh, stubble rotation, you know, peas versus wheat, uh, darker stubble versus, you know, cooler stubble, row orientation. One year we saw a bunch of survival in the east-west direction and none in the north-south direction. We thought, well, we better go have a look at that. Um, and the only thing we've concluded from all of that is fresh cereal stubble is not a good place to grow winter canola. It's just too cool a microclimate, especially if you're fall seeding. It just, we, we're, it, it's too cool in the fall, too cool in the spring and can be too wet in the spring also. So anything but cereal stubble and that's, you know, we're trying to diversify a wheat-based system. So that's not a great thing. Uh, we've looked at nitrogen fertilizer rate. There was some concern out of Kansas that you couldn't apply too much uh, nitrogen in the fall, otherwise you'd lose some winter hardiness. We actually found our best uh, winter hardiness and yields was where we, when we put a full rate of nitrogen on at seeding in the fall. So it didn't seem to be an issue for us. Anything that could push or accelerate that seedling growth in the fall uh, was, a, was a positive for us. And then a, few, a couple of years ago, I guess this was in 2018, I had this great idea that I would seed Roundup Ready canola, winter canola, and nurse that in under Roundup Ready corn. And I could show you a whole series of pictures of how that story went. We'll just leave it as a good idea that didn't quite work. And uh, I actually have got some new angles I could look at that might work better, but it, it almost worked, but not quite. Um, and so we, we have been involved in the National uh, Winter Canola Evaluation Trials with Mike Stam. Um, 
for my, uh, at least every other year for most of the last 20 years. This is what our plots looked like in, in uh, early November of 2020. And this was a second seeding. We had gotten a little, a significant shot of rain in uh, early August. And I thought, hey, let's, let's take advantage of getting this stuff started on time. I think we had four tenths of an inch and we thought, hey, if we get another, you know, if we get it seeded and get some more rain, this will, this will work. Well, of course, the next rain we got was a month later. And so uh, they, all those seedlings died and we had to reseed. And this is a close up of what that site looked like in early November. Um, and I did see it in December uncovered with snow and it looked to me, this is about uh, three and a half leaf stage and it did not look like it's gonna make it. So I expect, you know, as good as that looks, I think we probably won't have any canola in the spring there. And then I just wanted to uh, briefly mention some work with uh, spring canola seeding rates. Um, one thing that's always struck me about canola or any crop that has high inputs that can be grown elsewhere, um, you know, the inputs really matter in, in, in Montana where we've got lower yield potentials. Um, I, I come from northeastern Saskatchewan, and so I've got two brothers-in-law up there that farm and, you know, I get a chance to ride on equipment with them once in a while, and they're talking about growing 80 bushel of the acre spring canola now. I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, it used to, we used to think we're doing good if we got 40. And we would think we're doing good if we did 40 in dry land Montana, and yet we're paying the same price for seed that they're, they're paying, and, and so... Uh, their potential return on investment for that seed is much higher than it is for us. So we, we just started, again, this is unfunded research. We just started poking around, looking at different rates. And so this was, well, I meant to switch this to units you'd understand. This was a target rate of uh, 10 plants per square meter, about one plant per square foot. And actual emergence was about half of that, so half a plant per square foot from this year. Uh, pictures taken July 8th, 2020. Uh, double that rate, we were targeting about two plants per square foot here, got actually about one plant per square foot, but starting to almost look like a canola field by target of, of four plants per square foot, or a little less than four, ending up with about two plants per square foot, it actually looks like, you know, it looks like canola. Um, here's the double that rate, and then double that rate again once we got up to uh, sort of a full target of 160 plants per square meter, or 14, 15 per square foot, we actually started to accelerate maturity and do some things that might be useful in a drought uh, sensitive environment. Um, and so we did this for a couple of years in 2019 and 2020, and this is what the responses look like. 2019 was the wettest year I have seen at Bozeman. Wettest in the sense that we never even went for even one two week period throughout the entire summer without useful rain. Uh, even even in our you know other wet years, usually we at least get two, three, four weeks of drought in there somewhere. We never had that in 2019, so it was a ideal climate for growing uh, spring canola. And you can see the yields uh, pounds per acre here. So this is 3,000 pounds with that 60 bushels an acre. Um, and you know a nice response. This was our, this was our actual uh, measured seed densities and you know the inflection point at pretty low seed rates, uh, three plants per square foot. 2020, on the other hand, was quite dry. Uh, maybe not the driest ever we've had, but certainly one of the driest. And so you can see a very different yield potential. But again, that inflection point for yield was about, you know, maybe five plants per square foot. And if we put the numbers, you know, put some more numbers to it, and this, I was working on 2019 prices, so I probably wasn't selling the canola for enough compared to today. And I think I was charging $14 a pound for the seed. So by the time I subtracted off the extra seed, it took me to get to those higher densities. This is the kind of shape of the curves that I got. So showed me that there's, there's probably some potential in these low seeding rates to, uh, to make it more viable in Montana. And here's the 2020 response where, um, you know, I did get a little better response at the five plants per square foot, but, you know, two was as good as 12 in terms of uh, this year, in terms of the kind of net returns using the pricing that I did. And so this is research I pr we probably should be doing more of. Um, and, you know, I guess I'll just raise the question, how do we get serious about canola research at Montana State? Here's an example of a cedar that I could buy, I think, for about $40,000 that would let us do some serious singulation research with canola and canola seed is a valuable commodity. And I think we need to treat it as such um, instead of sort of seeding at these old, uh, you know, road drill rates that are probably putting way too many seeds in, in non-uniform spacing in the soil. So, and I think that's all I had. I just wanted to throw enough out there to sort of tease some discussion if there is any, so. Uh, I have a question, if, this is Donnelly Saki. 
Perry, what do you, what do you think an ideal uh, plant population is? Well, that's a, that's a question I'd like to have an answer to, but I know that in our low productivity, uh, you know, dryland environments especially, so irrigation would be a different deal. Um, I think we're going to have to get, to be competitive, we're going to want to go about as low as we can. Now, the trouble, let's say we found that an ideal rate was two plants per square foot. You know, then you start targeting that, you better be sure you can get it because you're, you're right on, you know, you're close to that inflection point where if you get anything lower than that, you're probably going to start losing yield. But, but we've had some winter canola trials where, boy, we were probably down around half a plant per square foot or less. And I'm shocked uh, at the kind of yield you can get, um, you know, when you give the, the canola plant uh, space and resources to grow. And if we had shatterproof, uh, that, you know, I think, I think the shatter pod technology has been an absolute game changer for Montana. And if we could get that on winter canola, that would be an even bigger game changer because then on some of these thin stands, uh, you could afford to let the plant ripen up without, uh, you know, w with a variable stand, so. Perry, this is Ian. I, you know, I, I strongly support you attempting to acquire a monosem. I, I chuckled a little, it looked like a picture of mine. Oh, good. Uh, yes, that, uh, those ultra narrow row units are, you, know, you can space them down around 10 inches and in our seeding rate trials, they've proved very effective. And actually the seeding rates that we found for Washington um, have been astonishingly low. It's, it, it's just making sure you get the seed in the right spot and then it germinates. Mm -hmm. so having a good germinable seed is really the recipe for success for those singulators. You don't need a lot of seed. It definitely cuts your costs. Great. Thanks for that, Ian. Well, Thanks for having me, everyone. Uh, I'm Simon Fordyce from Montana State University. Before I start, I want to let you know that there is a toddler at large in my house, and uh, she's feeling rather rambunctious today, so she might try to break break the door down on me. But um, yeah, so I uh, so we'll just forge ahead anyway. But um, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about what we what we've been doing at the Central Agricultural Research Center where I work. Uh, that's near Moccasin, Montana. Um, we're going to go through the statewide variety trial um, uh, data that I have that I, I manage those trials along with Dr. Pat Carr at, at the at the research center. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about pod chatter ratings as it as they relate to some of the research we've done with. Um, acid soils in the middle of the state. Uh, and then I'm going to go through a, a sort of a recently developing story on uh, residual nitrate levels in, in our area, in our soils, which tend to be really shallow and variable. Um, so yes, we've got, let's see, we had six locations in 2020, the Montana statewide uh, spring canola variety trial. Conrad didn't work out because of staffing, uh, staffing issues, which was a bummer, I know, for some suppliers. Um, but we had a, had a pretty good year across the board. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few. This is table four from that, um, from that report. You can find that report at the, at the link at the bottom of, this, of the screen here. Uh, I wanted to put NC NCC 101S from Photosyntec. I put that on the cover. Uh, uh, I found another picture from Craigmont, Idaho, uh, where we, we see that as the f as the first flower there too. Um, it's a it's a relatively new uh, variety, f flowering early. It really helps to beat that beat the heat, um, and that can make a big difference for yield, as we know in, in Montana. Um, I've highlighted the upper up and comers here. They're just kind of new new ones to our trial um, and they look like they're they're doing pretty well. We have that non-GMO Photosyntec um, from Dynagro seed. We got a True Flex. Of course, the True Flex variety is letting us put more Roundup on um, uh, up, up to first flower, I think 44 ounces up to first flower. And then this Invigor LR3. 344 PC is that uh, True Flex and Liberty Link. Um, that could be a, a pretty good option for for um, guys struggling with different different weeds in Montana as well. There's a good video uh, that you could you can go follow that link and find uh, what I'm calling the old the old hands or, or just varieties that have been around a while um, and did well in, in 20 
2020 spring spring trials. Um, again, we've got some this 402. If you watch the video over the over the break, Jim Johnson uh, from from Star Specialty Seed uh, talked a little bit about that, and then of course we have some of these older Liberty uh, Invigor varieties as well doing doing well. Now, as has been mentioned several times, all of these are rated uh, for all of these in green are rated for. Uh, improved pod shatter resistance. Um, but so are these just from three different suppliers. So we, we, we've, this has come up a lot. We, we need to start seeing some more consistency in our, um, in our pod shatter ratings because it can have big implications once you get out to the field. And as an example of that, I wanted to show some of our uh, soil acidity work where we grew five different hybrids in three environments, um, all, all pH is lower than uh, four and a half. Um, so we, we had lime strips in those, in those trials as well. Um, and you can see this uh, plus egg lime, minus egg lime, here's your yields, here's your uh, oil contents in percent and, and, in, and in bushels just multiplied by yield. And what I want to highlight is this uh, little little cross here indicating the varieties that sh that showed excessive pod shatter losses, and that was just in one location. But uh, there were m minimal, you know, there were some shattering every year, and that actually, when you analyze it across um, locations or across environments rather, that ended up giving us a significant difference uh, between 6090RR, which is a Brett Young variety, and the uh, three cropland varieties. They all outperformed that 6090RR, and I think uh, largely that had to do with shatter differences. Um, so here's a, here's a picture of that trial. The limed plots are on the right, uh, the canola in the foreground here. The one thing I wanted to point out was just how, well, for starters, how bad that that unlimed blot is. I mean, there's looks like there's more wild oats in there than there does canola. Um, but the even on the lime side, you know, part of that may be differences in variety, but I think mostly this is a spatial heterogeneity issue. I think we're seeing the these uh, acidifying soils become really, really variable, and that can that can uh, spell bad things for for the way the crop matures. This is a this is an image of safflower, um, a field that had pHs below, uh, I believe, below four. And so, what ends up happening is you get really poor emergence. Now the crops around those acidified areas, on the fringes of it, uh, are going to emerge, but they're going to delay. They're going to be delayed in maturity, and so all those uh, neutral pH, those plants growing in neutral pH soils will mature quickly and hence will probably begin to, to shatter uh, more readily than, than plants in non-acid soils. So uh, you can really lose, if you're waiting for things to, to sort of even out, you can really lose a lot if you're not gonna, if you're not using a, a pod shatter resistant variety. So, got to start my timer, I see, but um, I also just wanted to touch quickly on a recent story about residual soil nitrate. Um, in some ways, it's ironic that <laughs> that the central staff of the Central Ag Research Center are, are managing the statewide variety trials because we simply cannot grow uh, a good canola crop in at the Central Ag Research Center. And we think that has a lot to do with our shallow and variable soils. I don't think it's just that I'm 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 not that bad at at uh, managing these trials, but our tar our highest yield since I've been there in the last four years was uh, 27 bushels per acre, and that was that was a pretty good crop for us. So I don't think I, I'm I'm that bad because others have struggled with this too. Um, but one thing that one thing that sort of came came up was this old paper from Clayne. Uh, by Clayne Jones that showed these these nitrate soil nitrate differences um, between fall and spring and so that's what this graph is, is showing here you've got previous crop on the x-axis and then the 
what would be the, the spring nitrate minus the fall nitrate in the same location. Um, and you see, you know, oil seed is actually, these differences aren't significant, but uh, compared to the small grain, the oil seed was, it was canola. He didn't put that in here, but it was canola at every location. And compared to the small grain, we're, we're seeing a little bit of a boost, but um, personally, I, I don't think that's real. You see a lot of noise across locations. So uh, these, are, these are just six locations. I'm showing the fall concentration in the darker gray and the spring concentration in the lighter gray. And if you look at CARC, this is where we are, the Central Egg Research Center here. You can see just all across the board, there's not uh, a much difference between fall and spring with the exception of the fallow treatment. Um, and, and in that fallow treatment, you actually lost a lot of nitrate. And across the board, we, have, we just have high residual nitrate levels. So what's, what's going on here? If you look at one location and you do, uh, do a little bit of stats on it, you will get a significant difference between uh, residual not nitrate in spring following canola when compared uh, to, to wheat. So I don't think that's any sort of, I don't think we're talking about mineral, more mineralized nitrogen. I don't think the seed, you know, there is a little bit differences, differences in the C to N ratio. So canola might break down a little bit faster, but really this problem seems to me uh, a nitrogen use efficiency problem. And one, some recent work that supports that, uh, what we call our canola matrix trial, uh, has been going on. We're, we're going to enter our third year of that study. It's kind of a cool study the way it's laid out. Um, it gives you to gives you the ability to test many different sequences. Um, but we grew one of these trials at the Western Triangle Research Center, which has similarly uh, shallow and variable soils by some maps, and uh, and one at the Central Leg. Research Center, and we didn't fertilize the one at the Central Egg Research Center. So all I've done here, not using any stats, I've just highlighted in orange the the sequences with canola in the second year, um, and then in green, the a continuous hard red spring wheat crop. And you can see that in those fertilized plots, we end up with a lot uh, a lot higher residual nitrate where canola was planted in the second year uh, compared to those unfertilized plots when, when they all fell lower. So I really, I really do think this, this story is one of uh, poor nitrogen use efficiency uh, in canola when it's, when it's established in shallow and variable soils. And I think that, you know, we could get into some of, some of the mechanisms there, but I think really the structure of this route, it's, it's designed uh, to suit sort of volatile environments. So if the nitrogen fight, if the roots find the nitrogen, they can take it up quickly um, and then it can incorporate that um, to, to ex expand the total volume of soil that is able to explore. Um, well, if there's a barrier to those roots, it can't expand in the, uh, the volume and it ends up leaving a lot of nitrogen behind. Now that's a theory that I have and uh, or a hypothesis, I guess you'd say, and um, more work is needed there to explore that. But one thing that is, it is kind of interesting to see, there's a globally consistent um, soil great group map out there um, that I've started playing around with. And what it suggests is these, these orange basically these darker orange areas uh, are, are soils that are possibly pretty, quite shallow and highly variable. Now, I don't, we can zoom in a, a little bit more on Montana. Um, I don't think this is sort of a no, cazol, no canola zone being mapped in this darker orange. What I think it, it really is possibly um, areas that we need to be, if you're, if you're considering growing canola, we need to be thinking about um, our fertilizer recommendations, maybe some, um, maybe some tweaking need to, needs to be done there when, when we start as this novel crop sort of encroaches on these, these shallow soils. Um, but I think also, you know, beyond just straight up uh, fertility recommendations. I think it could, it could imply that you know these shallow variable soils might be better 
uh, better targets, you know, for people interested in canola, and you start playing around with variable variable rate technologies, including fertilizer, but also but also seeding rates. And I think that's that's important to know because what the soil depth issue really is is a soil water storage issue. And if we could start to align our 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 uh, seeding rates better with the amount of storage that exists and and we can do that in a spatially explicit way I think we could really stay on top of this um, this high residual nitrate issue and start to uh, drive it down because where so where the aquifers underneath these shallow soils really tend to be uh, higher in nitrate uh, higher in, ni in nitrates, which causes uh, a whole range of issues from human health to, to environmental ones. So I think, um, yeah, I think there's a cool, uh, at least an interesting story that, that, that needs to, um, needs a little bit more attention there. And um, I'm hoping to uh, work, work on this kind of stuff as I move forward through my, through my education. Um, with that, I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna hand it over. Uh, hopefully, that was interesting and and could, um, like like Perry said, we can have some discussion around this either right after the presentation or or later on today. Um, so yeah, thanks for your attention, and uh, I'll, I'll field any questions if there if there are any. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. Um, we did have one question come in. Uh, are the plants per square foot actual plants or planting rate? That was that was asked during uh, Perry's presentation. Yeah, I, I I needed to unmute myself there. Sorry. Yeah. So what I reported there was actual plants per square foot. So which tended to be lower than what we targeted. Yeah. This, this is a uh, Don Wysocki. I have a question for Simon. Your your pH values. Um, are those a zero to six, zero to 12 inch depth? What, what depth pH is that? Um, everything I reported today would be zero to four inches. Okay, and ha uh, follow up, have you, have you looked at uh, KCL extractable aluminum along with that? You know what that's doing? Yeah, so so it's actually from the from the data that I've worked with, the KCL extractable and the the saturated aluminum um, were, uh, you know, there was a range, but the actual the concentrations were what would be considered toxic. I'm not follow, I'm not quite recalling what that level was, um, and they were actually more variable. the The coefficient of variation was a lot greater for our aluminum. Uh, extract data than it was for the actual pH data, which just tells me that, you know, we have a, you know, there, there is, we often talk about these things in terms of low pH, but, but like you just said, what really is going on is, is uh, it matters what's happening with that, with that aluminum, those heavy metals that become available. And um, so if those are more variable than pH, then we, then we really have a, a bigger problem than we, we even realize is how I take it, but. Agreed. Right. All right, thanks, uh, Montana State. We're gonna move further west to the great state of Idaho and Jim Davis giving an update from U of I Canola Research. All right, thank you, Karen. Um, getting the presentation up and going here. Um, so today I want to give you guys a little update on some of the research that's been going uh, on at U of I over the last last few years, actually. A number of people involved in the research here, and I, I've, I've listed uh, hopefully most ev everybody. Uh, people like in, in italics there have made contributions to the research and moved on with their lives. Uh, there's still a few of us here uh, continuing to work on canola. Um, and with that, I'll move ahead. Um, Currently, we've got projects that are funded by several different organizations. Uh, we have a project funded by the uh, DOE uh, that's just wrapping up that looks primarily at uh, 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 canola, uh, rapeseed, and mustard as a feedstock for, for biofuels. I'm not going to talk really about that, pro about that project much. 
Um, our main canola funding uh, is through the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, their Supplemental and Alternative Crops pro Program. Uh, and that's a program that uh, funds several researchers here at the U of I, uh, as well as uh, projects at Washington State University, Oregon State University, and one researcher in Montana State. Uh, at Montana State University. And our part of the program at the, at the U of I is multi-pronged. Um, we do work with cultivar development, uh, all stages of, breed, of breeding and cultivar development. Uh, I'm not really gonna talk about that today. Uh, we also do some variety testing uh, throughout Northern Idaho and Eastern Washington. Uh, we do some agronomic research uh, that I'll talk a little bit about. Um, there's an economic component to the grant uh, and we're also working with Blackleg. So a lot of stuff going on. The Idaho Oil Seed Commission is also currently funding a couple projects for us. One looking at management strategies for flea beetle control uh, and one looking at plant growth regulators uh, in early planted winter canola. So I wanna start with our crop rotation study, uh, talk about uh, what we've done just very briefly. Initially, uh, we set these up as a as two-year studies where we looked at either a spring or a fall rotation crop and its effect on a subsequent winter wheat crop. Um, this last year, I've combined the winter and spring crops together, so it's all on one site. Previously, uh, the winter and spring crops were, were at different sites, and so they were two separate trials looking at those rotation effects. Uh, and so hopefully this will give us some more, more insights across the spectrum of, of crops. But you can see we, we have the small grains, wheat and barley, uh, some peas, winter and spring peas, uh, as well as spring and winter canola uh, and winter wheat. I just want to take a quick look at some data uh, from three years uh, of the winter rotation study. This is uh, the performance of winter wheat after different rotation crops. Uh, we've got bushels per acre here on the y-axis of winter wheat following winter wheat, following winter canola, following Austrian winter peas, or following fallow. And you can see following winter canola, we saw about a 17% increase in yield uh, compared to wheat on wheat. And for Austrian winter peas, we saw about a 20% increase. Uh, on fallow, uh, we only saw a 3% increase. Moscow is a fairly high rainfall zone, and so we don't typically see an advantage uh, to growing wheat on fallow here like you would in central Washington or some of the other drier areas in uh, the Pacific North, Northwest. Uh, let's go the right direction. Uh, if we take a look at some economics on this and, and look at gross returns, uh, dollars per acre, so before any expenses are, are subtracted, um, <clears throat> we can see that uh, wheat on wheat uh, gave us uh, 1300 and about 1360 dollars per acre back over the two years uh, and winter wheat on winter canola gave us 14 about 1450 dollars per acre over the two years even though we saw the highest yields in austrian winter peas uh, or at least the highest wheat yields in austrian winter peas um, it was one of the lower returns and there's two things going on here one uh, pea prices have been pretty low recently, but also I didn't do a very good job of growing winter peas, and so I'll take some responsibility for that. So our pea yields were low, and the price and the price was low. In the current rotation studies that I have going now, uh, we've added some winter edible peas, and those are yielding quite a bit better. Uh, we should be able to get a little more price, a little higher price for that as well. Um, of course, in the fallow, we've only got one year of returns uh, in those, so so it. it it doesn't look quite as good, uh, obviously. Um, but both from a, from a yield standpoint and an economic standpoint, having winter canola in the rotation uh, looks, looks pretty good. We did a little water infiltration work uh, in these studies. Um, and I just wanna compare some of the infiltration that we saw with the different spring crops, uh, spring wheat, barley, spring canola, pea, winter wheat, winter canola, Austrian winter peas, and fallow. Uh, this was water infiltration after the um, rotational crops were planted uh, or were har after they were harvested but before the winter wheat was planted. Uh, so these were, would have been done in September. 
Uh, if we look at liters per hour, uh, we can see wheat and pea uh, infiltration is pretty low, uh, between five and six liters per hour. When we go to uh, following barley or following spring canola, the infiltration goes up to 13 to 14 um, liters per hour. The really big story is what happens to water infiltration after winter canola. Uh, we've jumped all the way up to 27 liters per, per hour. This was something that was addressed in that soil health uh, video that, that you saw. And so it's something that we see as a big advantage to winter canola uh, in, in a crop rotation is a lot better moisture infiltration in the fall and over the winter to really get that moisture down so it can be stored for the following crop as, as well as reducing erosion. Uh, we do have an ag, um, ag econ component uh, in, in, in our research. Uh, this is handled by Kate Painter, whose email you see here. Um, she and the rest of the UI Extension Economics and Farm Management team have put together a website called the Idaho Ag Biz website. Um, and I wanna really direct your attention to the crop budgets that they put together. These are enterprise budgets built on Excel spreadsheets. Um, and these, you can go in and download these and customize them to your own farm. Uh, so you, you can go in and change the inputs, change the cost of the inputs, change your yield expectations, change the prices to match your farm gate prices. And they're really a good tool for exploring uh, different potentials for different crop rotations on your farm, uh, as, as well as changing some management practices within those crops to give you an idea of what your returns might be. And Kate has set these up so they look at net returns. So she takes into account all costs, um, not just your, vari uh, your variable costs. So they're a very powerful tool and, and they're useful while they're aimed at, at, at primarily at Northern Idaho uh, and Southern Idaho uh, these are useful really for anybody in the Northwest because you can go in and change your inputs and really customize them to your own, your own, your own farm. And so if you do a web search for the Idaho Ag Biz crop budgets, uh, this website will pop, will pop up. Uh, and her direct seed budgets are the ones that are the most current. Uh, but again, you can put in all of your current, your current information in, into the spreadsheets, and customize them. One thing you can do is, is look at some different costs of, of diff compare different costs of production. And, and, and Kate did this example for us, where she's looking at the costs of the different herbicide uh, resistant systems in spring canola, uh, looking at the cost of seed and the herbicide applications. Um, we can see that the Roundup Ready system and the Clearfield system are both coming in between 60 and $65 per acre uh, based on the prices that she had. The Liberty Link is more expensive, a more expensive option. Uh, and conventional is actually a bit more expensive depending on how many herbicides you end up put, putting on that system. It's also important to note that if you're in Northern Idaho or Eastern Washington, it can take advantage of that non-GMO premium uh, with Phytera and Warden. There is also a, there's also a premium that helps out on the other end. Um, Typically it's been about a cent and a half per pound. And so these numbers at $27 an acre are based on an 1800 pound per acre uh, yield. But this is just some of the stuff that you can do using these enterprise budgets. Uh, Kate also looks at projected net, net returns. Uh, this is some information that she put together looking at a, a projected returns over the next year for a variety of crops. You can see a lot of our rotation crops have projected negative net returns when you consider all costs. Uh, spring canola is, is a bit higher than, than the legumes right now. Legume prices are, are actually pretty poor. Uh, spring canola prices are looking up. So that's good news. Uh, she expanded this into some uh, crop rotations, looking at three-year crop rotations. She's using average yields for Northern Idaho. Uh, and you can see the crop rotations here. This first one, for example, is uh, soft white spring wheat followed by spring canola. And then all of these crop rotations are then followed by winter wheat. And so this doesn't take into account any potential yield benefits you might see in, in, in your rotation. These are just average yields. But we can see that the, these three rotations on the left with spring canola are, are looking like they're gonna offer us the best returns um, in dollars per acre per year 
compared to the other rotations that have the currently lower price legumes in them. All right, so I'm going to move on a bit here um, and talk about black leg. Uh, this is, is caused by, the, by, by a fungus, Leptospheria maculans. It wasn't observed in northern Idaho, Idaho or eastern Washington until 20, 2011 when we found it in Boundary County in Idaho up near the Canadian border. Uh, and then in 2014, uh, we found it in some seed production fields near Lewiston, Idaho, uh, somewhat by accident. But when we started looking the next year, we found it was actually widespread in several counties throughout northern Idaho. And then later, it was also found in eastern Washington. Fortunately, even though it's widespread, the disease incidence has, or the disease severity has been pretty mild so far in the inland northwest. Uh, when we first got started, Kurt Schroeder's group uh, did a survey. Uh, this was done by a graduate student, uh, Justin Picard. Uh, so he looked in the area of north, of north central Idaho, um, did some collections, surveyed 50 locations, found Black Leg at uh, 39 of those locations, and ended up with 128 different isolates of uh, Leptospheria maculans. Uh, and 10 isolates of uh, Leptospheria biglobosa, uh, which is a similar fungus, but it produces much less severe disease symptoms. Um, they did confirm these uh, with pathogenic tests and some molecular work. Uh, and they found that uh, in the maculans that we have both mating types present, uh, which means we should be able to have sexual recombination and the fungus is going to evolve. Uh, so can develop new races uh, in the Northwest. Uh, so canola has 14 different resistance genes that have been identified, and there's 14 corresponding A virulence genes in the pathogen. So these are basically the, the genes that the resistance genes recognize to get a resistance response. So we wanna know which of these genes are in our pathogens in the Northwest. We know which, which resistance genes we want, want to use. Um, and so you can identify these through some molecular techniques like uh, PCR, as well as screening differential resistant lines in, in greenhouse assays. Uh, and they found like 15 different races in the Idaho populations that contain different avirulence genes and different combinations that you can see all spelled out here. These, these are the genes that were in the particular race and how many of the isolates had those particular races. But really, the summary we want to look at is that that 92, roughly 90% of these uh, races have either uh, the AVR5, 6, 7, 11, or the LEPR1 gene. And so these are the genes that we need to be focusing on in our canola varieties to have the best resistance response in the Pacific Northwest, at least the inland Northwest, Eastern uh, Washington and Northern Idaho. So this was all from Northern Idaho. Uh, more recently, Tim Pollitz at WSU collected uh, 86 isolates in Eastern Washington, and he supplied those to Kurt's program. And these were examined by another graduate student, Kayla Yearout. Um, and basically we, we saw uh, si similar results where 100% of the isolates had either the five, six or seven or LEF R1, uh, similar to what we saw in Idaho. 90% of the isolates had 11 or LEF R2. This is a little different. We didn't see LEP R2 in Idaho uh, in, in, in the initial survey. Uh, in Washington, we also see both mating types. Um, in this, these particular set of isolates, they were in a ratio of about six to four. So, but roughly ha half and half. So we should, the, 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 the pathogen should, should be able to evolve uh, here in Eastern Washington as well. Uh, Kayla is, is running, as part of her master's program, a, uh, a black leg trial where we're looking at the effect of, of, of fungicides. Um, and I see when I modified her slide, I made a little typo here. But she's looking at two diff different varieties grown at three, three locations and looking at disease incidence with a seed treatment that was insecticide only or an seed treatment that also had fungicide in it, which is this is typically what, what, what we use. Uh, something like um, Prosper Evergold or Helix Extra, an insecticide and, 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 and a fungicide. When we look at disease in incident across the locations, 
you can see that the Grangeville site had a much higher disease in incident. This is percent, um, basically it's the percent of plants that showed lesions. Um, Mercedes has better black leg resistance than, than, than Amanda, and that's apparent across all three locations. Um, but when we look at the uh, fungicidal seed treatment, we didn't really see that it's having any effect on uh, the um, disease in, uh, incident um, at all, all those locations where the, uh, the disease incidence was similar, whether we had the seed treatment fungicide or not, which is kind of what we expected. We wanted to make sure that was the case. Because really what we were interested in is the effect of a foliar fungicide uh, application and different timings on the Black Lake incident. And so, again, let's focus on Grangeville, where we had a higher level of, of disease. Uh, we can see with no application, no foliar uh, fungicide application, uh, we had about a 60% disease incident incidence. With a fall application to fungicide, that drops down to about 28%. With a spring, just a spring application, that's about 16%. And when we have a um, both fall and spring, the disease incidence drops way down to 5%. Uh, less disease at the Moscow and Genesee sites. But, but again, we saw those decreases when we had either a fall or a spring application of fungicide. So did this make any difference at harvest? Uh, no, actually, it did not. Uh, so in the Grangeville site, we're looking at about 6,000 pound canola. So we were in a good field and a good year and in a good corner of the field, I would have to say. Uh, but as we look across all these different fungicide treatments, we can see that the yields were pretty uniform. Uh, and that was also the case with the lower incidence at Genesee and, and, and Moscow, which were slightly lower yielding sites. Uh, this is very similar to results that I saw in 2016 on a preliminary study where we did see reduced lesions in the crop after a, a fall fungicide application, but we didn't see any changes in yield. So while the disease is, is widespread, especially in winter canola in northern Idaho, uh, it doesn't seem to be very severe. Uh, Kayla is also tracking when the spores are released, specifically looking at ascospores which are the airborne spores for, for the fungus. She's put out uh, traps at two different locations. This apparatus has a little fan in it, sucks in a constant stream of air, and it collects spores on a rotating piece of sticky tape. And so she's got to go out once a week and change those tapes and then brings them back to the lab uh, to examine them for spores. Uh, so she's doing quite a bit of driving around northern Idaho, uh, changing the tape in these uh, traps. There's also weather stations along with these traps so we can, uh, we can track relative humidity and temperature uh, along with the spore counts. So the upper line here at both Genesee and Grangeville is the relative humidity from fall through late spring. Uh, this lower line is the temperature in degree C from fall through late spring. Uh, and then these little tiny bars here are the spores that she's collected. And so She's only finding spores both at Genesee and at Grangeville uh, in late May, or sorry, in late spring, so April, early May. Um, but we're seeing uh, the, the, uh, the disease respond to fungicide applications in the fall, and, and we're also seeing lesions before these these spores are, are out. So we're not entirely sure what's going on, but we're going to continue. Kayla is going to continue collecting spores and try to get a better answer uh, on, on uh, when these uh, disease is actually move, uh, is moving around the region. So now I'm going to shift gears again, talk a little bit about some of my flea beetle work. Um, flea beetles are becoming more and more of a problem in the in, inland Northwest as we increase acres. Um, and even though we use uh, insecticidal seed treatments on nearly all the crops that, that, that are planted, uh, all the canola crops that are planted, uh, we're finding that some years on uh, some sites, we have a, a severe infestation. We need to come in with a foliar application to keep things under control. I typically advise growers to uh, scout their, their crop in the seedling stage every two to three days. Uh, when the weather is above 57 degrees, which is when the flea beetles start to fly and get very active. Anytime you get above 60 degrees, uh, you can actually have a lot of um, 
of defoliation in a pretty short period of time. So you need to be paying pretty close attention even when you do have a seed treatment on there. So this study, we had five different spring cultivars all treated with Helix Extra. Three different seeding dates, trying to hopefully target some high flea beetle pressure. Uh, we had sprayed and unsprayed treatments, 15% uh, defoliation, which tended to be about three to four weeks after seeding. It was funded by the Oil Seed Commission. Uh, I've done this for three years now. Let's take a quick look at the flea beetle damage over those three years. This is a score of one to nine with from the plant standpoint with one being a lot of damage, uh, complete defoliation and nine being no damage. So you can see our scores ranged from about six and a half to eight. So especially in 2019, we didn't see a lot of damage. Uh, this last year in 2020, this is getting into that, you know, 30% defoliation zone. And so this is actually a, a fairly substantial damage. A days to flower each year around 45 to 50 days from planting, which is pretty typical in northern Idaho. A seed yield range from a ton to about 1,400 pounds, depending on the year. These are the uh, uh, five varieties. I included a, an oriental mustard because they're very attractive uh, to, uh, to flea beetles. Uh, a very early in industrial rapeseed called industrious. Uh, the CP930, uh, Star 402, and Dynagro 200. You can see there's a, some differences in how attractive they are to flea beetles. Again, this is a score of one to nine, with Pacific Gold being the most attractive and having the most damage at 6.7, and Dynagro having the least damage at 7.6. I picked these varieties because they, they have a range of, of maturity times, with uh, Pacific Gold and Industrious being the, the earliest and flowering at 43 to 44 days uh, and Dynagro being the latest flowering at, at 51 days after planting. And you can see some variation in seed yield with Industrious having the lowest yield about 1640 and CP 930 having the highest yielding highest yield at around a ton followed very closely and not statistically different by star 402. If you look at the different seeding dates that we used you can see there was some variation in, in flea beetle damage with the highest damage being at the intermediate date, uh, about the middle of May, um, a little less damage at the early date, and, and, and even less damage at the late date. But if you look at the seed yield across the dates, you can see it as we delayed planting, we reduced yield considerably. Um, and so for northern Idaho, this last week of April, May 1st date, I tend to look at as an optimum. Uh, so here we're almost 2,500 pounds over the three years of the study. Delay two weeks, we dropped down to just under 2,000 pounds. Delay four weeks and we're down to 1,000 pounds. So we're taking a big yield hit when we delay planting. So even though we see a little less flea beetle pressure and these later planting dates, that's not a, an approach to control flea beetles. Now, if we look at, at the sprayed and unsprayed treatments, Looking at the flea beetle damage score first, we can see by spraying, we did reduce the damage. Uh, so higher score here is less, less damage. Uh, and we also had a higher yield when, when we sprayed. Average across the three years of the study, we had about 212 pounds yield increase by spraying. Current prices, that's gonna more than pay for the cost of the insecticide ap application uh, and give you a little bonus in return. So it does look like, like spraying when you have uh, some flea beetle damage on the seedling stage is worthwhile. So a foliar spray can improve yields. You need to be out there scouting your fields. And so if you're seeing some uh, flea beetle damage in your spring canola, even when you have a seed treatment, it may very well be worthwhile to put on some foliar insecticide. Uh, late seeding reduces yield. Um, and, and I believe that's mostly because it delays flowering uh, and it reduces the time from uh, seeding to flowering, so we have less vegetative growth. Uh, that was supported by some data I didn't present. Um, both early and late seeding could avoid some flea beetle pressure, uh, but obviously we don't want to delay planting because of the yield costs. But we also want to avoid planting into cold soil, so you don't want to go too early. Uh, planting into cold soils is just going to slow the crop down. It's going to make the weeds uh, uh, com uh, compete better, and it's going to expose your risk to early frost, early frost. All right, uh, shifting gears again, I wanna talk about some work we've done in winter canola. 
Typically in northern Idaho and eastern Washington, winter canola is planted on fallow um, because we need to plant it fairly early to get it through the winter uh, and we need to conserve some moisture to get the crop established. But when we plant it traditional dates on fallow, some years we don't have enough seed zone moisture to establish the crop well. So one response to that has been uh, moving the planting date forwards uh, to when we do have good seed, so seed, seed zone moisture. Um, but we find if we go too early with the planting dates, the plant gets very plants get very large. They use a lot of soil moisture. They get moisture stressed. They don't harden off well going into winter, and then we see increased winter damage, uh, and sometimes uh, uh, actually uh, very poor survival with those early planted times. So we're kind of in a catch-22. Uh, we don't want to plant too late and run out of moisture. We don't want to plant too, uh, too early and, and have the plants not harden off for winter. So it's been suggested that one approach might be to plant early to take advantage of the seed zone, seed zone moisture uh, and then use plant growth regulators to keep the growth in check. So I set up a study um, in 2019. We, we planted moderately early June, July 14th, three different cultivars, three different plant growth regulators, Apogee is a product that's used in cotton and grass seed production. Bonsai is a product used in the horticultural industry. And then quash fungicide is a fungicide labeled on canola that's been reported to have some plant growth, re growth regulator effects. I used four rates applied a month after planting. Plants were still pretty small at that stage. Um, a zero and then a one X, two X and a three X rate. These were just rates that were either based on some conversations I had with um, Brian Caldbeck, who's done some PGR work, or what the rates were actually recommended for, for the crop that the, uh, the uh, uh, products were labeled for. This is what the trial looked like a month after uh, the PGRs were put on, two months after planting. I uh, see I had a pretty, uh, pretty, pretty heavy stand uh, this, this year. The crop established real well, uh, but it didn't get very big uh, this year, even though it was plant, planted late. Uh, this is the quash treatment with the low and high on your left. Uh, I'm sorry, the low on your left and the high on your right, zero in the background, and then medium on your right in the background. So not a lot of visual difference uh, uh, show, showing up in this photo, although in the data we'll see there was a little bit of growth, growth reduction from the quash. This is bonsai, again, low on your left, high on your right, and then in the background, zero and, uh, and medium, and we didn't see much much visual effect from the bonsai. Uh, if we look at the apogee, we're starting to see something going on here. Uh, this is the low and the high. Uh, so the high, these plants are definitely looking smaller, especially compare them to this treatment uh, uh, next door, which was the uh, bonsai treatment. Uh, and then if we look at the two plots in the background up a little more closely, this is the control of the zero, and then this is the medium rate. So we, we did see some growth reduction with the apogee. A quick look at some data, growth reduction scale on a one to five, one, no growth reduction, five, a lot of growth reduction. This is the quash. Uh, we did see uh, some more growth reduction at the high rate. When you look at winter survival, we did have some winter damage. This is a scale of one to nine with one being complete death and nine being no winter damage. Um, not much difference, really no difference uh, between the different quash treatments for winter survival. We did see some a little bit of increase uh, in yields, however, when we applied the quash. Although it's not a completely cut and dried story because the high rate of quash has a yield that's similar to the zero rate. But, but we did see a little bump up in yield here from the low and medium rate of quash. Bonsai, I couldn't come up with any growth reduction. The plots all look the same to me. Winter survival. Uh, maybe a little better winter survival with the medium rate of, of bonsai, but not much difference. The damage is, is really all about the same there. Um, we saw a little bit of yield reduction or yield increase in the in with the uh, bonsai applications. Not a very straightforward picture. And after if you compare these bonsai yields back to the quash yields, you can see they're all actually lower than what we saw in quash. Uh, so let's take a look at Apogee, where we did see some visual effects, um, where I've got the, uh, the zero rate with the growth reduction of one, so no growth reduction. 
and then an increasing growth reduction uh, from the low, medium, and high, where we're up to, to almost a score of five uh, with a high rate of apogee. Uh, interesting story in winter survival, winter damage score 6.7 with no apogee. And then with the low, medium, and high rates, we saw less winter damage um, with a score of around eight. So, so the apogee was giving us a little better winter survival. And the apogee also gave us uh, some yield increases as well, moving from 2857 pounds with zero apogee up to 3172 and then 3476 with the medium rate of apogee. So it looks like, like there may be some benefits from applying the PGR to an early planted winter canola. Uh, but for me, this trial has really raised as many or more questions as it answers. As uh, We don't really know what the best rates are yet. Uh, we don't know what other products out there might work. There are a number of other plant growth regulators that we could try. And we don't know if any of these products will be labeled beyond the quash that is already labeled in, in canola. I'm currently repeating the experiment, but obviously we need to do uh, we need to do some more work looking at plant growth regulators before we have any good answers. I think I'm going to wrap up by talking about our regional variety trial. This last year we had 25 winter varieties and 28 spring varieties from 11 different companies, including the U of I breeding program, six winter sites, spring, six spring sites. Uh, this data is available online at the U of I Brassica uh, website. You can just do a web search for uh, University of Idaho Brassica breeding and, and that'll pop up. Or you can also find it on the PNW uh, Canola Association website, pnwcanola.org under their research and resources menu. Uh, this is the winter canola yields at the different, different locations. You can see we had eight, eight locations with variable yields, the highest yield was at the irrigated site in Odessa, Washington and Central Washington, about 5,500 5, pounds per acre. Our lowest yield was at the dry land, uh, fairly dry site in Davenport, Washington. Um, but a, a range of yields, but overall pretty good trials, I thought this year. I just want to look at a few uh, varieties up close. Uh, the mean across the trial was 3516, uh, all sites. I'm sorry, the minimum uh, yield across all sites was 3,500 pounds with the mean across all sites of, of 4,085 pounds. Amanda and CP1022 uh, came in right close, close to the mean. CP1022 is a new variety that uh, Landa Lakes Winfield has licensed from, from the University of Idaho that carries group two herbicide resistance to help out with some plant back restrictions. Um, we also had uh, CP320, which was a Roundup Ready um, variety that yielded very well, just, just over the mean. The highest yielding variety in the trial was a new variety from Rubisco called Kicker, nearly 4,800 pounds across the entire trial. And then Mercedes, Phoenix, and Surefire, uh, which is a line out of the Kansas State Breeding Program, uh, also did well in the trial. Again, you can look at all the different varieties on those websites. This is the spring canola yields. Um, we had seven sites. Uh, normally, I have a couple more sites in eastern Washington, but due to travel restrictions from COVID and being a little shorthanded, uh, I would, had to drop a couple of sites, but I picked up another site close to home uh, near, near, near Moscow. You can see that the, uh, the trials at, uh, in northern Idaho, two trials at Moscow and Genesee, yielded quite well, just under 3,000 to, to about 3,700 pounds, um, around a ton at Craigmont, 2,700 pounds at Dayton. Uh, had a difficult time at Tiddleton, it, a lot of extra stress there this year. Uh, and then Hermiston was just, just un under a ton. Uh, but mean across the trial is about 2,500 pounds. And I think this is really representative of the variation that you can see in spring canola, even in a single field. You can have clay knobs or shallow soil areas where your yields are going to be very low if you look at just those areas. And you can have deep soils uh, in other parts of the field with good moisture where your yields are probably going to exceed 3,000 pounds, pounds per acre. And when you average them all out, you know, you're going to be looking at anywhere from 1,800 to 2,500 pounds on a field-wide basis. Again, I want to look at just a few select spring canola cultivars. I'm going to look at the Moscow site this time. 
Uh, the mean there was 29.99. Or 29.99, the best yielding uh, variety in the trial at Moscow and at all averaged across all the sites was MC101S. Um, it's very early and it does very well with uh, in stressed sites. Moscow is 36.49. We had several true flex lines, just like they did in, uh, in the Montana trials. Uh, Brett Young 62.04, CP9978. Dynagro 760 and Starflex, these lines all did quite well in the trials. Um, we had a couple of clear field varieties. The best performing one in the trial this year was Dynagro 200, right at the mean of the trial at 2977. And then we had this uh, interesting Invigor line, which was mentioned during the lunch break in, in, in the um, BASF video, uh, 3344. It's got some club root resistance. Uh, it's got pod shatter, uh, and it has a stacked herbicide resistance. It's got both resistance to Liberty, Liberty Link, and it's got the TruFlex gene. So it gives you the option of going with whichever herbicide option that you want, depending on your weed spectrum. Uh, and it also yielded quite, quite well in the trial. So we've got a lot of options, I think, for spring canola and winter canola ver uh, for uh, varieties, um, some really good options, especially compared to what we had 10 or 15 years ago. Oops. So that's all I've got for now. Um, this is my contact information. If you have questions anytime, feel free to drop me an email. I'm in my office during the winter, probably about half the time when I'm not in the lab or the greenhouse. So feel free to give me a call. And if I'm not in, just give me, uh, just leave me a voicemail. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for everybody to showing up. I'm really happy to see, you know, nearly 100 people here, here this afternoon. So uh, that, that's great. Great to hear your uh, research. Thanks, Jim. You're welcome, Karen. Okay, heading south to Oregon with uh, Dr. Don Wysocki. I'll just get started here. Uh, I'm going to summarize some of the work we've done, been doing in Oregon. Um, just some acknowledgments. We've worked with a number of people, uh, Jack and Jim, and Kurt at, at Idaho, and Karen and Bill and Ian and Isaac at, at WSU, and we've got funding from uh, the Washington Oil Seed Commission. Uh, I, I just wanted to give you a little bit background. This is not stuff I'm going to talk about, but we've been doing work for a long time. And Jim mentioned uh, the variety testing. We've had two sites uh, working through them uh, for probably more than 25 years. Jim did mention that that's at the, the Idaho website. We've done a bunch of work with nutrient management, nitrogen, sulfur, and boron. Uh, that's uh, part of our fertilizer guide. And then we've done work on harvest techniques and planting dates. Uh, and that's at our research reports. Uh, I had a little bit of trouble with this website today, so I'm not sure what's going on there, but um, you can go to those sites and, and get some of that information. What I'm going to talk about today is fungicide trials we've done, some spring uh, piola work, some early planting of winter canola, and some row spacing work. Uh, we just concluded four years of work on black leg and fungicides. Jim covered some of the work they've done, uh, but black leg is probably the most important disease of winter canola. Uh, it's in Canada, the U.S., Australia, Europe. Uh, China uses it as a, a, a trading issue. Uh, they say they only have this less virulent type. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, just a brief uh, synopsis of black leg uh, puts out these uh, long distance spores and it uh, either seed or uh, inoculates new plant and uh, so here's here's the the ascospores that sent out the long distance spores uh, those hit a leaf and form, form these lesions if you get close to a lesion you see the pechnidia and the mature plant you see the black leg you know and it goes up the stem uh, jim outlined the the timing of when we were finding uh, black leg, you know, we 
uh, followed Idaho's lead in, in 215. We were finding Black Lake in a lot of the area. And so we initiated this study. Uh, we did it uh, for a four year period ending this year. Uh, summary, this was Amanda winter canola sown uh, early in September on six inch spacing. Uh, this is the fertility material. Uh, we apply SURE 2 to control grassy weeds and uh, volunteer cereal. Uh, we're applying the fungicide with a backpack sprayer, 15 gallons of water, um, typically swaths, canola in June, end of June, and combine in early July. We had uh, eight treatments in this experiment repeated for four years, except uh, in, in 2017, the first year we had no fall treatments. So they were all spring treatments. We had a control, a fall treatment, and then we had split treatments. Here's a fall, uh, early March, fall, mid-March, um, early March, early March and April, mid-March and April, and early March, mid-March and April. So we had uh, applications, uh, multiple applications in some case to see how well we could control uh, black leg. Just to summarize this, I'm not, I'm not gonna show you four years of data of all these treatments. I'm just gonna pick the best uh, scenario here and, and cover that. Uh, but you know, uh, we had the fall, uh, spring, and then these uh, split applications. Uh, one of the things we did was we looked at disease severity. So any, anything that had uh, disease on it and, and the, the way we assessed disease, we, we cut 20 feet of row and looked at all of the stems at 20 feet of row. And this is uh, black leg infected stems. If it's less than 25%, that was a one. 25 to 50 was a two. Uh, 50 to 75 to three and anything greater than that was a four. So we had a severity scale reading as well as uh, percent infection, percent of plants infected. Uh, okay, this, this is a summary of, the, of our best treatment uh, response of seven ounces. And this is azoxystrobin in early March. So one application in early March, we were getting the best control uh, we had no response to fall applications, and we did get improvements uh, with uh, subsequent uh, applications of the azoxystrobin, but uh, it, it did not pay for the additional cost. So uh, our recommendation now, just one seven ounce treatment in early March, but in 217, uh, we had a 500 pound yield increase with that one uh, treatment. Uh, we controlled the disease from 40% to about 16%. Uh, we didn't do a severity reading that year. Uh, this year, uh, 2018, uh, these all have crosses because it was pretty much sclerotinia wiped out at our trial. And the, this data just didn't, didn't pan out. So, uh, uh, it was a plus year for this trial. 2019 and 2020, uh, we didn't see a big yield response, uh, but we, we are still getting control with one application. This is my economic analysis, and you can get different prices for this material. Uh, I took one off the, the internet that wasn't the most expensive and wasn't the, the least expensive. The uh, Quadris or Zoxostrobin is about $240 a gallon, $1.85 an ounce. So seven ounces is a $13 treatment. Uh, I use our OSU custom application rate for running a self-propelled sprayer, uh, $6 an acre. So one application in early March would cost you almost 20 bucks an acre. If we, Take the four years that we've applied this. Uh, so we had four years of canola, and each year we applied one application. So that's $79 an acre for that fungicide application. 
But in year one, uh, we had this five hundred dollar or five hundred and fifty pound canola increase. Uh, this five hundred and fifty pounds of canola uh, is a break even. So at fourteen and a fourth cent, uh, that pays for this four years of application. Uh, July of two seventeen, canola bid was nineteen dollars and twenty eight cents a hundred uh, for. So for a four year return, when we had just one yield increase, uh, that netted us $26.84 an acre. So once in four years, if we can get this uh, kind of response, it's still worth that to apply this fungicide, even though in some years we weren't getting a response. So my conclusions here, uh, we had no benefit from a fall application. Uh, single application in early March provided the greatest benefit. So my recommendation, apply seven ounces of quadris in early March. If you have about 5% of the plants or more infected with those lesions uh, at that period. Uh, and, you know, if you're in these cost parameters uh, that more than pays for it with one yield response in five years. Okay, I'm going to cover a couple other experiments. Uh, we did a, a trial where we sowed uh, peas and, and spring canola uh, intercropping this season. Uh, this is what it looked like uh, early in the season. We had peas, we have canola. Here we have a mixture of peas and canola. A little bit later in the season, end of May, uh, you see peas are blooming, canola starting to bloom. In early July, here you can see canola and peas, these crops growing together. Uh, we we harvest this, did this material together with, with our plot combines. Uh, this is what it looked like in the grain tank, looked kind of like a mess. Uh, we we didn't want to lose anything, so we you know we were probably taking in more trash than we would if, uh, if we were just harvesting a, a single crop. Uh, we did clean these materials, um, so this is what our canola looked like. Uh, that's what our peas looked like. Uh, and this is a summary of what we saw this season as far as as pounds per acre yield. Uh, peas is the is the brown here, uh, blue is the canola. And what these are, are uh, seeding rate combinations. So uh, a 1x seeding rate for uh, canola is 14 seeds per square foot. Uh, 1x seeding rate for peas is 10, 10 seeds per square foot. And then these are, you know, two thirds of that rate uh, two thirds canola, half pea, two thirds canola, third pea, uh, a half of canola, two thirds of peas. So we had all these combinations. And, you know, these are the, the, the yield ratios that we saw. This is probably the worst year that I've ever seen for uh, spring canola as far as slowness of getting out of the ground. Uh, it took us a month to to know whether we had a stand of canola. Uh, we seeded around the 20th of March. We'd had a rain about three days before that. We thought we had good moisture, uh, but then it didn't rain again for a month. Uh, the canola did come up, but it was really slow. Uh, this is some uh, row spacing work we've done in the past. Uh, I'm gonna show you a couple slides of this, but this is yield by row spacing and sowing rate. Uh, four pounds or eight pounds of seed per acre. Uh, this is a culmination of about three years of, of work. Uh, so 12 inch spacing, 18 inch spacing, 24 inch spacing, and 30 inch spacing. So these 12, 18, and 24, in most years, um, these yield values are, are about equivalent. Uh, in some years, our 30-inch uh, row spacing 
would yield better and some years not. So this one here to me is, uh, depending on weather conditions and so there, some other environmental conditions, we may not always yield up to snuff to these other three row spacings. So as a conclusion to that, uh, we can grow canola up to 30 inch spacings. Uh, optimum's probably 18 to 24 inches, uh, preferable 30 inch. Uh, seed bed condition and seed zone water is favorable. Uh, we can seed down to about four pounds or three or four pounds of seed per acre. Yeah. And the last thing I'll mention is some of the early seed canola work we've done. Uh, and we, we've done this for a number of years. Uh, the last couple of years we haven't, and it's mostly a funding issue. So we, we chose uh, three varieties or four varieties here. And these all have uh, a pretty good uh, ability not to flower in the spring in the summer. Uh, some varieties seem to, they will become reproductive that first year, even though the, they haven't gone through a cold period. But uh, these four varieties uh, have a pretty strong fertilization. And, you know, we can plant them as early as June, and they will not flower until the next season. But this is the kind of thing that we saw uh, by planting date, uh, the earlier planted, uh, the higher the yield response. And this is this is basically a function of stand uh, establishment. Uh, we get late in the season. If we don't, we haven't had rain, we've lost our, our seed zone water and it's hard to get a stand. And uh, the next slide here will show the stands. Uh, when we seed it in June, we're we're getting stands of about seven plants per square foot. When we see it in July, we had two plants per square foot. And in September, we had, you know, just barely over half a plant per square foot. So that you know, this yield response here, uh, is basically a stand establishment uh, response. And Jim did mention that, you know, when you seed this early, you use more water. But, uh, if you can consistently get a stand, you know, this is a better yield, even though we, we use more water because this a half a plant per square foot is not effective at using the water that's there. All right. Thanks, Don. Again, if you have any questions for Don, um, type them into the Q&A and he'll answer those as they come in. Um, going to head north and wrap things up with a WSU. I think a lot of you are aware of the research that's been going on there since 2007, but we'll start off with um, Dr. Ian Burke. Yeah, thanks for the, the time this afternoon, uh, Karen, and I appreciate everyone's uh, opportunity to, to listen in. I'm not gonna take a lot of time because Isaac actually has a, a lot more uh, presentation to give and I have a feeling we're gonna run out of time. It's, it's been great to see all the stuff that's been going on with, with canola, um, canola research. So. Uh, my intent here today is just to kind of give you an overview of, of the currently funded programs we have uh, going on within WALKS. Uh, you know, as Karen mentioned, that was a, a program that was started back in 2007. And, um, you know, at, as it was originally intended, it was part of the bio, the Washington State Biofuels Initiative. And now um, it's evolved to um, be uh, a canola focused project. Although I think that um, over the long term, over the next um, few years are likely to, to revert back to something that looks more like uh, it, as it was originally, particularly as the, the Washington OLC Commission can uh, begin to take over funding some of the larger projects that WACS currently funds. As you can see on this list, there's a there's a wide range of topics we've funded uh, over the last biennium, which ends in 2021, uh, and I expect to begin the process of uh, recrafting that um, RFP to re-engage the, the WSU faculty and ARS faculty that are involved in the project. Um, you know, it's currently sort of divided in two pieces. There's the part that funds Isaac Madsen's program um, focused on uh, extension research in, in oil seeds. And then there's the part I manage, which is the competitive grant program, and just kind of give you a sense of, of some of the things we're doing. Um, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I was going to talk just a little bit about um, Pollitt's and Neff's work. 
uh, in particular, you know, Tim Pollich, who's an ARS um, scientist, uh, has been working to understand the microbial basis for yield reductions in wheat um, following canola that, that some have observed. And uh, Neff has been involved. Originally, he was doing Camelina work, but we've um, pushed him into doing some uh, more applied canola research. Hopefully, it'll be the outcome will be applied. Um, so Tim was good enough to share a few slides with me. He's collaborating with um, Dr. Schillinger, Jeremy Hansen with the ARS, and Dan Schlater, who's now a scientist in Michigan or Wisconsin. Um, and, and they've been doing, again, work on understanding what's going on in, in the systems work, in the systems setting, where um, and this is work going on in Ritzville, where uh, Schillinger's been running a, a long-term research project where he grows four different crops, winter wheat, spring wheat, uh, winter trit, or winter canola, and then rotates them to spring wheat and then fallow. And in the spring wheat leg, there's been some observation of, of yield drag. And um, Tim wanted to understand what was going on. So he went out and, and, um, and tried to understand the changes in, in the bacterial communities, particularly in the rhizosphere of the spring wheat, and he was able to observe that um, there appears to be a rhizoctonia species that's being promoted after winter canola uh, versus winter wheat. And that pathogen might potentially explain some of the yield reduction. He's gone back to resample in 2020 and then hopefully um, we'll be able to um, solidify that bit of information. The other thing he's been able to notice is that there's a um, very low level of AMF, or muscular mycorrhiza uh, fungi uh, after a rotation of winter canola. And those are um, organisms that are responsible for, um, you know, they're symbiotic fungi. They're, they're, um, they don't really, we don't really necessarily understand how they, um, what their role is in dryland wheat cropping systems, but we've noticed that their, their overall level is much lower after winter canola. So um, again, he's forming a picture of perhaps why we're seeing some of that yield drag. Uh, when we engaged um, Neff in getting him to, to take on a little bit more um, work associated with canola, he um, came up with a series of objectives. This is two of them. Um, he's really interested in, under, he's, a, he's a plant physiologist. He has an incredible skill set associated with um, transforming plants. And so he's been working with a, a gene system that we know has some capacity to increase seedling size and, 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 uh, and seed size as well. And maybe that might help uh, improve uh, winter canola emergence. Uh, so he's working on transforming canola to do that. Uh, and another uh, project he's been working with um, PGRs to understand seedling and our juvenile plant response to those. And I, you know, it was good to hear Jim's work on it. I, uh, he didn't show any pictures that showed an effect. Um, this is pacrobutazole, the, the, I think that's the, the bonsai product that um, Jim was mentioning. Uh, in our work in the greenhouse, we can definitely see an effect. And so somewhere there's potential to see this product or some of the products Jim's mentioned um, applied in some meaningful way to, to stop or reduce overall growth and perhaps uh, improve winter stand survivability and, and so forth. Uh, I did want to just end up with a, a mention of, particularly since Perry showed the picture of the monosome, just to kind of give you a sense for why this is an important technology to consider if you're, you're at all looking at canola. If you can do this, um, it can potentially reduce your overall seed costs. So the monosem is pretty nice. This is a seed plate. It's a vacuum plate planter, and so there's vacuum on the other side of this plate. And when the um, this, you know the seeds spin around uh, as the you know the the planter's moving forward, you'll see the the, you know, the seed drop, and you wind up um, with a e very evenly spaced stand. And if you have very high seed germination and uh, germinability, um, stand establishment very nearly equals the actual number of seed you drop. Um, versus what you do, what you get necessarily with a drill, which is a little bit different approach. You can see some grinding and, and typical things happen with a drill. So the, the monosem represents sort of a, an interesting approach to improve efficiency. Um, when we've done a lot of work, this is just one of the examples I have, um, and I apologize, this isn't grower units, but uh, you know, when regardless of what seeding rate we use of the monosem, yields are usually always the same uh, here on the left-hand side. When, we, you know, when you go and dig into this a little bit more deeply, you, know, you see the seeding rate on the bottom. This is the, the, the number of seed we put into the ground. The monosem really doesn't miss. We know that's what we planted. Um, and that's the black line versus the um, plants that we actually got. And um, that's the red line. Right? Actually, that's that actually plant potential is a yield potential per plant. And um, so you can see it, the, the actual seeding rate for getting sort of close to the maximum yield is, is somewhere on the order of 20, 
25 to 30 uh, plants per meter or per, per yard. So um, I think we probably could have gone a little lower even. So um, when you when you look at that, what you wind up with is is a, you know anything above a certain seeding rate is a lot of wasted uh, money, unfortunately. So um, I'll finish up there and and uh, turn it over to to Isaac because I know he has a lot more information to get to you. And uh, appreciate the opportunity to mention what we're up to. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Ian. Hey, Isaac. I'll just try and, um, I guess, more than anything, give everybody a, a taste of what we're working on, and hopefully um, there's good chances to follow up in, in the future. And also, like Simon, I have a toddler at home, and so sometimes there's noise, but I think we're middle of nap time, so we should be great. Okay, so this is just an overview of uh, research and extension, sort of some projects we're working on outside of what Ian is working on. <clears throat> and I wanna um, just summarize it really quickly and then dive into some of these in a little more detail. So we have the large scale variety testing program. I think some of you guys are familiar with that. Karen was running that for several years while she was uh, still with us at WSU. And we've kind of expanded that um, <clears throat> out of extension and, and added a lot of research, layered a lot of research on top of it. Um, and then we're also looking at stand establishment and survival in winter canola. That's a, a, a very major area of interest, especially as you head out into sort of central Washington. And then we've also started looking at alternative production systems, uh, similar to what Don Wysocki talked about and the Piola, and then some alternative oilseed crops that we're hoping to look at more in the future and some of which we're looking at right now. I won't um, bother to look at yield data on these large scale variety testing um, programs simply because uh, Jim Davis and the Montana folks did a great job of showing us some small plot work. So I want to just highlight the real purpose of doing these large scale programs is that we can look at the variation um, in things like stand and, and nutrient <coughs> concentrations and uh, and in, in pod counts and flowering as we go across a field. So here's a beautiful picture from a spring canola trial in the Palouse. And you can see uh, we're going up a, here, a hill in this particular block and the next block over, you couldn't even get a picture of the whole thing because it went over a hill. So that's one of the great things we get to work with in the Palouse region. <clears throat> so on top of yield, we've been looking at the variability in stand counts on these um, so this is maybe more representative of what you would get out of a air drill operation like you would have on a farm as opposed to a cone seeder or um, a planter like we're looking at in research and just to plug on that i do think planters are the way to do canola probably in the future i'm aware they're expensive and not really around right now but i think that's the direction we're going to want to head eventually uh, looking at some winter survival counts in the winter varieties also um, some initial soil biology um, <clears throat> sampling that's been done, some tissue micronutrient levels, and then uh, we've done some seed quality work. I'm going to only focus on the stand counts and the tissue micronutrient <clears throat> levels as far as this goes. So just to give you a little, a little bit of an idea about the intensity of our sampling here, this is um, from our Davenport trial. So each of these strips is a different variety and, and they're all replicated. <clears throat> um, four times and so they're they're randomized but each strip going through would be one variety and then we stop and we take multiple counts um, as we go through the field and we, and we summarize them and we do that to look at stand counts and also to look at pod counts and then we do that also to sample for micronutrients and well actually all nutrients but with a particular interest in micronutrients and, and that's kind of how we set up the sampling design on these the idea was that if, if we're going to all this work to put out these great um, big trials, we might as well look at some of the spatial variability in them. So it's kind of fun. We get a little bit of a, a G by E <clears throat> sort of project going on here. Uh, at Davenport then, um, breaking it down a little, little more, this is looking at the pod count variation. So this is um, <clears throat> going through the field and counting the, the number of pods on that leading stem. So there's, I'm, I'm sure most of you guys have heard that there's some sort of correlation to yield. People um, seem to think with that, and we haven't had a, a very good success uh, actually developing that correlation. But just to show you what this data looks like, 
when we're looking at the sort of spatial representations across the field. And you can see actually um, possibly some variety effects happening here where this variety, um, they were getting, we were getting higher pod counts up. We can summarize this data. So looking at stand count and yield across these, these trials, and we have now have five site years. And I think this is really um, similar to what Perry and Jim Davis and, and Don and all of us are, are sort of seeing that we can get into some lower stand counts and um, we can we can still yield uh, relatively high yields. So this, this location here, we actually almost sprayed this field out um, when we were walking through it before we actually had collected the stand counts, it was so low and it looked so rough <clears throat> that we were kind of like, oh, I don't know if we're, we're gonna actually keep that. And that was at Cloverland in 2020 and it ended up being our highest yielding one. And I can tell you from having walked that field a lot last spring, uh, that field that the canola got up to my shoulders and, and I'm about 6'1". So it, it grew up into a nice <clears throat> big jungle. And uh, I guess I, I went through here at the last minute and pulled some of our slides, but same thing with pod counts. We're not really seeing correlations between pod count and yield either. Looking then at our um, nutrients, so we're doing the same thing with nutrients, and this one's kind of fun. We had this X seed in here, which is um, a rapa, not a napus, and so it was actually had um, quite higher concentrations of zinc in it across the field. So you can kind of pick out the the reps of um, the X seed. So here's one, here's one, here's one, and then this this is the last one. So that's that's four four reps. But we're using this to look at so sort of what we could expect to find as far as um, concentration differences, looking at macro and micronutrients across a field, but then also between between the varieties. So we haven't um, we haven't pushed this to the point where we can really make recommendations on it. But what I can tell you is that when we take samples, even taking those samples at the at the same stage, which in this case was um, the, the sort of that four to six leaf stage right before you get into get into bolting with spring canola. Um, there's there's significant variations between these varieties um, and the concentrations of the different nutrients they're taking up. So that's sort of an interesting result we're starting to look at. Stand establishment in winter canola. We've done some in moisture experiments in the lab, some priming, so that's soaking the seed in the field, and then some wetting agents also in the lab. I'm, um, just going to show you this third one because the first two have been sort of failures so far. Um, but this is different gravimetric um, moistures that we had wetted the soil up to. And then you can think of these vertical lines here, um, like LD50s, sort of like a lethal dose, but it's not lethal in this case. It's a did we germinate? So one is we germinated and zero is we did not germinate. And this dashed line here is using a wetting agent. And so we were actually able to get 50% 50, 50 of our seeds to germinate at a slightly um, <clears throat> slightly lower percent moisture um, in this instance. So that's something we'll continue to look at and probably try and replicate out in the field. Winter survival, what we're doing now is we're running around and we're, we're measuring um, plants and we're measuring crown height as well as width and then canopy size. Uh, my, un, my grad student and I actually went around and, and measured 500 plants this year. So we're starting to build a database of the size of plants as they go into winter. And then the next measurement we're gonna look at is if they survived or not. So sort of establish the dimensions you can expect to survive. So this is um, some planting day work, some landscape position work, and then some um, plant growth regulators. Since we've already talked about plant growth regulators today, I'll, I'll sort of focus on that. <clears throat> and. Uh, these are different locations, but they also were planted at different times. So Ritzville here was planted in June, um, and then Davenport was planted in mid-July, and then La Crosse, both of these locations are in the same field, but different landscape positions, um, were, were planted in, they were planted in uh, later in July. And I just want to point out on our PGR treatments here, <clears throat> what we were finding is basically that Davenport location, there was no effect and that Ritzville location, there was no effect. Um, Davenport is quite a bit, had, this is crown height we're looking at. <clears throat> so it had quite um, a, a, a taller crown height than Ritzville. And it also had a higher um, plant population in there. And then 
we look at these two locations at lacrosse and we see that there is some significant effect um, based on our, our rates of PGRs. Uh, and then what I wanted to point out too is that based on position, landscape position in that lacrosse field, there was also a significant effect on crown height. So this uh, low land position had a significantly shorter crown. So we don't know if that's gonna translate into winter survival this year, um, but we'll be taking those counts here soon and, and we'll be able to um, collect all that data and put it together. But it was interesting the the top position here or the highland position appeared to be droughting a bit from what I could tell. And so that's where I would be <clears throat> um, just interested in, in seeing if that follows through. So I think these PGRs are really interesting and, and I'm hoping that we can make something useful out of them. But I'm also um, thinking there's a lot of other factors, not just planting date that are gonna affect whether the PGR actually has an effect or not. So I think the, the next series of work we'll be doing is gonna look at uh, density date and PGRs and the interactions between all three of those treatments. So moving on to sort of alternative production practices, um, we've done some companion cropping work. That's this picture over on the right, where we planted oats and canola together in the hopes that that could help with stand establishment and winter survival. Um, we've done some grazing work, um, sort of a canola system, and then pea canola intercropping. The, the oat canola, <clears throat> data sort of showed that um, we did sometimes get a more uniform stand, but um, we didn't really improve winter survival. In fact, we, we significantly um, decreased winter survival the one year we have data for that. So we have this decrease here in winter survival from 51% um, with just the canola monoculture to 34% with the intercropping. <clears throat> so um, there's, there's a, a pro of if we're trying to graze this, we get a better forage quality if we um, include the oats, sorry, over here on the right, but we're probably actually damaging our winter survival in canola um, when we do that. So uh, that just that's just sort of our, our first year of data on this. As far as grazing goes, and just because we're right up at 2.30 right now, I won't go through this table in depth. Um, <clears throat> there's preliminary data for this on a field day abstract that I'll, I'll point you to here at the very end. Um, but the, the, so the, the takeaways from this work is that grazing on average does hurt yield some, <clears throat> um, but that in some years you can get a decent yield even with grazed canola. And then occasionally in this situation in Dusty where we pushed the planting date really early, we pushed it all the way back to May, um, the severely grazed canola was actually the only canola sur that survived because its water usage was so low. So it was the only portion of the field that didn't drought, drought out in the fall. A little bit on Piola, um, <clears throat> looking at overyielding. So that's this land equivalence ratio. And you can sort of think of it as like one would be 100% yield. Um, so if you if you hit a one on Piola, it would basically say you're going to get as much peas just just as much yield out of the inner crop as you would out of the monocultures if you grew them side by side. <clears throat> and really what we've been finding from this first year, which included one spring trial in Colfax and one winter trial in Davenport, is that essentially we're getting a 146% yield over that, <clears throat> over those locations and different systems. And so we'll be looking at this a lot more closely. The other thing I wanna look at is the relative yields. So um, whether, if, if peas gets above one here, that means that, that it, the system is yielding more than the monoculture peas. So you can see that didn't happen very often. But sometimes in this canola, actually, um, we yielded better in the piola than we did in the monoculture canola. I'm not sure why that is. But in the current economics, I would say a system that favors canola is a better system in my mind. Um, it's, it's more likely to make money. So those are the relative yields. We also did insect data on the piola side of things, and we found that the piola had higher levels of beneficials than either the peas or the canola individually. And so this is something we wanna start looking at is soil ecology and above ground ecology in the piola. Some other alternative uh, oilseed crops that we're looking at, camelina, it's been around the Northwest for a while. Pennycrests were, um, there's a, a rather large DOE project that was just funded. We're, looking at pennycress in the region. 
And then we're interested in trying some just very initial work on perennial flax and, and silphium, which is like a, a perennial sunflower. And those are, I would say, sort of the time frame on that research is we're looking at something that's probably not going to be around for, you know, maybe 15 years or something like that. But it's, it's just getting our, our hands in it and checking out how it does in the Northwest. And right now those are um, <clears throat> coming from the Dakotas and coming from, um, I think, Kansas, yeah, the Land Institute in Kansas. A little bit on our extension <clears throat> uh, field days, if we can have them. Um, right at this point in time, we can't do those without approval from the administration. And so we'll, we'll just see how this year um, pans out as far as COVID goes and probably the rollout of the vaccine and um, see if we're allowed to have some field days this summer. I would love to get out and see some of you guys. Uh, been really missing that part of this, this job. Um, the spring canola strip trials, uh, <clears throat> those, those will be around this year, but once again, um, if we can't have a crop tour on those, I'll plan to make a, a video that we, just like we did this year. Um, I'm, I'm working on developing a webinar, webinar series that will sort of be a Canola 100 course this is the idea um, so that we can just, um, the topics that we understand fairly well, we'll, we'll sort of cement those into a, um, <clears throat> a series of webinars that can just live online. And so we can focus a lot of our in-person extension in the future, hopefully on some of these more interesting newer ideas. Um, we'll, we'll be given some timely topics throughout the year, trying to time those specifically with um, variety selection and planting dates and, and um, keeping up on pest scouting. And that'll be on the small grains website that, that Drew Lyon at WSU runs. And then I really wanted to point people to this dryland field day abstracts. So if you type in dryland field day abstracts, WSU into Google, um, it'll point you to the right place. In 2020, we had 26 on oil seeds and um, other alternative crops. So I think there's a few on garbanzo beans in there. Um, but that's really, I think it's a great outlet to just sort of see what the most recent research being done in our, in, in Washington state on these, uh, <clears throat> on, on oil seeds is. So I would really encourage you to go to that. And with that, just thank you for listening. And I'm sorry, we're, we're slightly over 2.30 now, um, but we have, here's my funding sources. So walks, which Ian Burke mentioned in some depth there. The Washington Oil Seed Commission, which has been very, very um, kind and a great benefactor of, of, of my research program and, and funded <clears throat> my initial stab at this PGR work. And then uh, the USDA NEFA um, SAC grant, which is in collaboration with the University of Idaho and OSU and MSU. So um, with that, I will take any questions. Thank you for listening. And hopefully that can whet your appetite for finding out uh, more and please feel free to reach out to me either by email or phone if you have additional questions on these topics. Yeah, Isaac, um, Jack Brown was asking when you planted the canola oat study, spring, summer, or fall? Oh, so that, those, were, those were fall oats, and that was, I believe, a late August planting at Davenport. I don't know the exact planting date on it yet, but it was, it was fall canola, and uh, they, they were planted together. The oats actually just kind of winter kill out, <clears throat> so and that was kind of how that was set up to work. I know that there's a few people that, that have tried that on a commercial scale and they've actually sort of been doing this uh, cover crop, cover cropping canola production system where they'll mix multi-species in there and, and try that. But <clears throat> I don't have a, I think I was really, really excited when I first heard about it, but having gone through this first year and looking at winter survival, I'm, I'm not, I'm not terribly um optimistic. We'll keep looking at it though. That was really interesting. Thanks, Isaac and all the panelists, university panelists. Yeah, again, um, you can see Isaac's email up here and phone number, or for any of these panelists, you can email pnwcanola at gmail.com for their contact information if you need that. Uh, so Jack Brown actually made another comment here that they had pretty good um, success intercropping canola for winter canola mixed with spring wheat, triticale, triticale and pea. Um, yeah, so I think the, the idea with that was um, to, to graze it off and to get some of the added nutritional value of those other crops. Yep, I think that, I think that's really interesting. 
I, I've now done several actual canola experiments on farm with growers. And what I found is the, you have to have the, you really have to have the right setup for that. So you have to have the water there and the field fenced because I've had a few collaborators go into it really gung ho and go through one year of grazing and then say, Oh yeah, <laughs> that was a lot of work setting up all the, the fencing. Um, and, and I would say the fencing and the water and making sure that they actually have good fiber available is really important. So when we've done it, we've always made sure that the cattle <clears throat> had to walk through um, something like tall wheat grass or um, scrub to basically um, between their water and the canola. Yes, so Jack's saying that the adding the, the triticalia wheat increases the fiber. That's exactly what we found. Actually, I have data on that if people are still sticking around and wanting to see it. And oh, I thought I, maybe I deleted it out of here um, at, at the last minute, but I have, um, oh, there it is. So um, let me actually make this one nice and big. So this is looking at uh, the, some of the different varieties that we have. So we have uh, Claremore and Phoenix. And then this was actually layered on a PGR study also. Um, from, from this fall. And so we've got with and without oats down here. And really you can see that the, um, the oats are the only factor that really significantly <clears throat> affected the, the forage um, quality. But um, the, the overall sort of takeaway is that you increase um, your fiber, fiber quite a bit by adding those grasses into the system. So I don't know if you increase it enough to actually um, for, for it to work really well because cows can get quite runny if they're simply on canola, um, but it's definitely better than just a, a monoculture of, of grazed canola that. The monoculture grazed canola, um, cows get really runny really fast on, on that. Um, and it's kind of because they're on a li liquid diet. So um, you can always send in a forage test of something you're growing like that. And, and look at how it changes the feed quality. But generally, as we add these grasses into that mix, we're gonna be um, increasing the fiber of the system. I would think that the peas would, I don't know how much they would help with fiber and they might um, hurt on the nitrogen side of things. Isaac, do you guys have any plans to be working with um, the animal sciences department on any of the either dairy or beef livestock, either the grazing or any more of the dairy side of things? We've tried to get funding for that, but um, we've been having trouble getting people interested in actually wanting to fund that that work. Yeah. So, so that's been that's been our challenge on that. Don Llewellyn at WSU has an extension bulletin that he he wrote on canola specifically. Yep. The, the thing that we really did differently from him is that we focused more looking at the canola yield. Um, and not just canola yield when we grazed it. So we actually were looking at the canola yield when we actually put animals on it. So we incorporated hoof damage into the whole project essentially. And natural fertilizer. And natural fertilizer. <laughs> I always point out to those who are really in love with regenerative agriculture, which I don't mind regenerative agriculture, but you you are only recycling, right? If unless you're bringing in external feeds. You can accelerate the nutrient cycle, but you won't create nutrients out of thin air. Yeah. Unless you're bringing in external feed and then you can increase it. All right, I don't see any other questions. There's some comments from Jack Brown. Um, and, yeah. and Jack, I believe you guys have a few publications out on this system, right? And I think I think that U of I, I think uh, Clark Neely, when he was at U of I, did some work on that and with with Jim and Jack. Yep. 